Uh, good day, everyone, and welcome to another interesting session of the seventh lecture workshop on transdisciplinary areas of research and teaching by Shanti Suru Bhatnagar Awardees. And it's our privilege to have with us today Professor B.S. Murthy, who's a director at Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad. And he has joined today to deliver his talk on a topic, High Entropy Alloys, an Exciting Class of New Materials. Now, he's a well-known figure in this area, but as a customary, I have to do this honors. So he started his academic journey with a diploma in metallurgy in 1983 and obtained his B in 1986 from BRC Nagpur, an ME in 1988 and PhD in 92 from ISC Bangalore. After serving at IIT Kharagpur for 12 years, from 92 to 2004, he has been a professor at IIT Madras for 15 years, 2004 to 2019, before taking up the director's position at IIT Hyderabad in 2019. He is an institute professor at IIT Madras and adjunct professor at Toronto Metropolitan University and University of British Columbia, Canada. He has authored 465 general publications and four books and has supervised 49 PhDs and 13 PhD students are currently working under his supervision. He has completed about 75 sponsored projects worth more than 100 CR and filed 20 patents. He is a recipient of numerous awards including the Shanti Saru Bhatnagar Award, Distinguished Aluminous Award of ISC and VNIT, National Metallurgist Award, Honorary Doctorate from Deakin University, Lifetime Achievement Awards of IIT Madras, and is also the Fellow of the Third World Academy of Sciences, Asia Pacific Academy of Materials, ASM International, Indian National Academy of Engineering, and all the three science academies of India. He is currently the Vice President for the duration 2022 to 2025 for the Metal Sciences Division of the Indian Institute of Metals. With these words, I now would like to invite Professor Murthy to kindly share his screen to deliver his talk. Let me put my mobile off. Yes, let me share, share the screen. Yeah. So please, friends, uh, please let me know if you are able to see the screen. Yeah, perfect. So, can we go ahead, uh, Manoj? Please go ahead, sir. Okay. <clears throat> friends, not able to see any of you. So, so as a result, uh, I do not know uh, how many are there, who are there, and uh, what your background is. I suppose you are all students and possibly have some idea of material science. And I do not know how many of you know metals and alloys. And what I am going to talk to you uh, as a metallurgist myself is about some exciting new alloys. These are called the high entropy alloys. So, so I will have to assume that you know a little bit of metallurgy about metals and alloys. And then you will be able to appreciate why these are uh, new materials. Mm -hmm. Because alloys are known for ages. People know that if I uh, add two elements together and uh, melt and cast it, and I will get some kind of an alloy. Okay? And there are different types of alloys that people know. And uh, uh, starting from a stainless steel, that every day you eat in plates, stainless steel plates, starting from that, to steels, to very exotic aircraft alloys, okay, and alloys which are used in space applications, alloys which are used in electronic applications, for example, silicon germanium kind of alloys. So there are a variety of alloys that are known. And what is so new in this and what is exciting in this? So, so that's what is a story that I want to tell you. We wrote a, a, a book on these alloys in 2014 and and then uh, the, uh, the publisher uh, told us that this is so exciting field, that there's so much of work happening. So can you, can you please uh, write one more, a second edition? So we wrote a second edition within five years. I think uh, this is not usual that within five years you come up with a second edition. And that tells you how exciting this field is and how many uh, people have been working in this particular field. 
Just to give you a, a brief on what we call them as conventional alloys. Conventional alloys, for example, uh, let's say one example of steels. Okay, steels are iron carbon alloys. On the right top, you see a copper zinc, which is nothing but brasses. Every one of us have heard of brasses. And the, the, the one on the top, uh, bottom left is aluminum copper, which is again uh, a very popular alloy. Anybody who has flown an aircraft, okay, or has been a passenger in any aircraft, you would uh, have experienced uh, this particular alloy because the whole aircraft body is typically made of aluminum copper alloys. And then aluminum nickel alloys, again, they are very fascinating alloys, which are used in, again, aircrafts as in the engine body. So the turbine blades in the engines are typically made of uh, aluminum nickel alloys or nickel aluminum alloys, if I can say so. And what is uh, uh, common in all these systems? Uh, and for that matter, any alloy system is that we usually make the alloys which have very small amount of uh, what is called the second element or the solute element and a large amount of the solvent element. So that basically means in these phase diagrams, we usually operate on one end of the phase diagram. For example, iron carbon alloys, if you think of steels, there is no steel anybody knows with a carbon content greater than 2%, okay, 1.5% or so, is the maximum amount of carbon anybody uses, 1.2% or so. So why is that so? The moment you add more than that, the steel becomes so brittle that you cannot make a good component which is usable. Same thing true with copper zinc alloy. Copper zinc alloy is brasses. About up to 30% of zinc in copper is usually common. If I add 50% copper uh, zinc uh, in this alloy, the alloy becomes so brittle that you cannot use it as a structural alloy, structural material. What are structural materials? Structural materials are those which have a good combination of strength and ductility. They should be hard and at the same time reasonably soft so that they don't break uh, like a, a ceramic cup uh, that you drink coffee in. You just drop it, it breaks into pieces. We do not want such kind of materials. If aircraft becomes like that, or uh, your car that you drive is like that, uh, the moment any small uh, bicycle hits it, then if it just crumbles into pieces, then such kind of uh, a car is of no use. So we want uh, metal, uh, metals and alloys to have a reasonable ductility. Same thing true with an aluminum copper alloy. There is no aluminum copper alloy that is known to anybody with more than 6% of copper. The moment you go to 10% copper, the alloy becomes so brittle. So these are the problems of conventional alloys. As a result, most of the conventional alloys have been majority, uh, majorly used on one end of the field diagram. And people hesitated to go to the center of the field diagram. Okay. The moment you go to the center of the phase diagram, that means when I have 50% of A and 50% of e, B, that kind of alloys are typically having intermetallic compounds uh, uh, and a number of compounds in these phase diagrams at the center of the phase diagram uh, that you can uh, usually see. As a result, such kind of compounds being brittle, the people avoided going to the center of the phase diagram. Why? Uh, for the first time in 2004, a gentleman by the name Professor Ye, I was just talking to him uh, half an hour back. I have a joint PhD student with him. Every month, first Wednesday of the month, we have a half an hour chat on how the thesis of the student is going. Uh, this gentleman is from Taiwan, from a university called National Tsinghua University, one of the popular universities, where he said, let me try what happens if I go to the center of the phase diagram, not in a binary system, but in a multi-component system. Okay? He said, let me take five elements, 20% each of those elements. So total is 100%. So 20% each of five elements and make an alloy out of it. Okay? We call it as equiatomic multi-component alloy. Okay? Multi-component because there are five elements and equiatomic because all of them have a similar percentage. 
And if I take that channel, what happens? If you understand a little bit of thermodynamics, okay, thermodynamics says that, okay, there are two types of entropies. One is called, what is called thermal entropy, caused by heating of a material, the randomness that is created because of thermal vibrations. The second is when you add elements, other solute atoms into a material, and if these solute atoms are randomly distributed inside the material, and then you get an additional entropy called configurational entropy. Okay, this configurational entropy uh, in, keeps on increasing. Okay, as we go to the center of the phase diagram. So at the center of the phase diagram, typically you have a highest configurational entropy. And if you try to remain in the center of the phase diagram, but having a multi-component system. Then, the, as you can see here, let me just uh, uh, use the pointer. Okay, so as you can see here, the configuration, the maximum configuration entropy is, goes by R ln n. R is a uh, universal gas constant, n is the number of elements. As I keep on increasing the number of elements, as you can see in the table below, if I have two components with 50% each of the component, 0.5 mole fraction, this is the configurational entropy, which is 5.8 joules per mole per Kelvin. Whereas if I go to three, maintaining equal atomic nature, 33% each, I see an increase. Go to four component, five component, six component, you see the entropy keeps on increasing as long as you maintain equal atomic nature. And the entropy can be so high that the system prefers not to form any compounds but to form a simple, what is called solid solution. It's a random arrangement of atoms inside. It is still not amorphous. It can actually become amorphous. We will talk about that also. It is a crystalline, but at the same time, random solution. Crystal. That means if I have a unit cell, okay, let's say an FCC unit cell, where you are supposed to have four uh, lattice points per unit cell, and I am putting five atoms, these five uh, elements, let's say, and these five elements will be randomly distributed. There is no specific location for each of the atom. And that kind of a thing is called a solid solution. And that's the beauty of such alloys. Why may I say it is a beauty? It is because now I have a multi-component alloy sitting at the center of the phase diagram, and still it is not brittle. Why is it not brittle? Because it does not have any intermetallic compounds in it. So solid solutions are usually ductile, at the same time strong enough. So you are making strong alloys at the same time retaining activity. That's a beauty. And if you look at the number of papers that are going, I have only shown up to 2018, I have not had updated this figure beyond that. So, so starting from very few papers, in the early stages to around 1,000 papers a year. Within about, uh, I would say, 15 years, the number of papers per year. Right now, if you look at 2022, in 2022, possibly I am confident that you would have uh, at least 3,000 papers in this field. So that is the way. It's a growing like a, in an exponential map. Okay? So that's the beauty of this field. And then what? We started this particular field in 2005. The paper appeared in 2004, and we and this professor called it as high entropy alloy. For the first time, an alloy prepared from thermodynamic concepts. Most of the time, alloys are prepared based on the property requirement. Okay, whereas here he said this is an alloy which is a, a, a high entropy alloy because the entropy of such a system is high. So what we try to do uh, in our work to begin with, you know, in 2005, I immediately got so excited about this particular work of uh, this professor. So I asked one of my PhD students, can you change your topic and let's start working on this. She was already working on something else for the last one year. And then she immediately agreed and we started working on it. So there are two ways of making these alloys. One is to take all these elements, five or six elements, take them in equal proportions, let's say, melt them, uh, all of them, and then cast them so that you get an alloy casting. The second way is I can take all these elements, okay, put them into something called a ball mill, high energy ball mill, and grind these powder uh, particles 
in such a way that you get an alloy powder at the end of it after some amount of some hours of boiling. So here you get alloy in the powder form, and whereas in the other technique, which is called uh, you know casting technique, you get the alloys in a rod form or in a ingot form or something like that. So here, if you take these six elements and start ball milling, after some hours of ball milling, okay, here the X-ray diffraction pattern on the left top bottom uh, says that you start with a number of elements with so many peaks, and suddenly you end up into just one set of peaks which are corresponding to BCC. So all these elements with different different crystal structures. I have aluminum here, which has FCC structure, iron, BCC structure, titanium, HCP structure, chromium, which has uh, uh, BCC structure, zinc is HCP, copper is FCC. So I am taking six elements with different, different crystal structures, but all of them are converging into one single solution, which has a BCC structure. And what is also beauty here is you can make them in a nano form because of the ball milling that I do. So the powder particles break and become nano. And each of these black dots that you see is one one particle of such a high entropy alloy. Okay, how do I know that this is a high entropy alloy? I can put my electron beam in a CM on each of these black particles and collect a spectrum from that called energy dispersive spectrum and analyze the composition. You see the composition comes out to be such that, okay, if you have six elements, 100 divided by six is 16.6. Each element is supposed to be 16.6 percent. And here, if you carefully look, it's all just plus or minus one percent, around 16.6. That means you have a reasonably uniform composition and every particle has a similar composition. That tells you that you have a uniform uh, composition of variety of nanoparticles can be generated by this kind of a technique. And can I go forward and try to see whether this uniformity is at the atomic level or not? There is a technique called atom probe tomography technique, okay, where you can actually see how atoms are distributed in a material. For example, if you have iron carbon steel, where is carbon sitting, where is iron sitting? You can see. For example, here, you can see uh, something rotating in this picture where all the pink colors, dots, each dot is an iron atom. It's a, a, a needle kind of a sample. So that's why it looks like a needle, okay? And every, the green patches that you are seeing here, they are all one to two nanometer size particles made of yttria. So it's a steel in which I have added yttria particles, yttrium oxide nanoparticles. So now I'm able to see where is yttrium oxide uh, sitting and where are iron atoms sitting. And I can pick up any one of the small region and analyze the composition of that region. That's the beauty of this. We have set this up at IIT Madras when I was there. Uh, and this is the first remotely operable atom probe of the world. There is no such remotely operable atom. So why I say remotely operable is because I have, if you see on the top, there are a number of logos. They're all my partners, okay? Each of them have given about two crores of money. Huh? And, then, uh, and then DST gave uh, about 25 crores, with which we have set up this facility called uh, a National Facility for Atom Tomography, which costed us about 40 crores. And now we run this in sh three shifts, Three operators come in eight hour shifts and we collect samples from all these partners and others, okay, and prepare the sample and put it in the atom probe, which is what you see here. This box is an atom probe. And once you put it, that these people who have given this money to us, we call them as partners. They all of them have a computer like the computer that I have in front of me right now. And they can operate the machine sitting in Bombay, IIT Bombay, IIT Delhi, IIT Kanpur and Karakpur and so on. So, so they can operate it remotely sitting from a long distances. And that's the beauty of this machine. And we have been able to now get excellent results from this. The whole country is using this facility now. Last four years, this has been set up in 2018, July, and now we are about four and a half years now.
and this kind of a machine. If I put one such high entropy alloy, this is a nickel, cobalt, chromium, iron. Four elements get 25% each of the elements. And if I put it into an atom probe and look at how the elements are distributed, you will see such a uniform distribution of iron, cobalt, chromium, nickel. There is nowhere any segregation. So there's a wonderful, at the atomic level, they are all uniformly distributed. You can also see where is carbon, where is oxygen, where is nitrogen. You can actually see a very small atomic number elements also inside. In most of the other spectroscopic techniques, very difficult to see uh, at, uh, atoms which are of a smaller atomic number. Here, you can actually see. And you can actually come, uh, measure the composition by picking up a small region and doing a quantitative analysis. And you can see here, the composition can be clearly seen. All of them are very close to 25%. Just to tell you that this alloy is homogeneous. Of course, sometimes, depending on the way you prepare these alloys, okay, there can be a possibility of segregations. And when the segregations happen, atom probe can show you where is which elements getting segregated. That also is possible by atom probe. Atom probe is a very fascinating tool where you can know at the atomic level segregation. Okay, this is a beauty of an atom probe. Now, we can also see uh, if you have two phases inside such an alloy. Okay, what is the composition of one phase? What is the composition of the other phase? All these colors that you see are all indicative of what elements are present. Okay, which element is getting segregated to which phase? All this can be easily seen at the atomic level. This is something very, very fascinating when you actually use them. Now, the next problem that we talk about is fine, these alloys, I can make it, they can be uniform in composition, but then what are the challenges? First challenge that comes to me is I do not know what is the phase diagram for such a multi component alloy. If I have four components, we all know if you have ever seen phase diagrams, typically we know phase diagrams of binary systems, A, B. To some extent, we know ternary. The moment you cross three elements, there are no phase diagrams available for a four component system or a five component system or a six component system. So I do not know what phase can be stable at what temperature, at what composition. So there is a need to develop phase diagrams. So there are quite a number of people who are using computational tools to find out phase diagrams. So we have also done this. This is one such alloy, uh, four component alloy. And if you try to do, find out the phase diagram, the y-axis is temperature and the x-axis is composition. And my alloy, the four component alloy has this black line, vertical line tells me that composition. And if you see that beyond a certain temperature, it's all liquid, and below that temperature, it's an FCC uh, phase, single phase FCC, until you come to a certain temperature below which there is a tendency for formation of multiple phases. There is a tendency for segregation at low temperatures. Okay, there are thermodynamic reasons why this happens. But what is interesting is if you make this alloy, by casting root, you see this alloy has a single phase FCC. At room temperature, please note it. So that means something is happening. That means this segregation that we are talking about or a phase separation that we are talking about has not happened for some reason. And that is the second problem that I'm going to talk to you a little later. So, and we also try to heat it, this alloy, to various temperatures to know whether this fellow is stable at various temperatures as a single phase or not. We try, uh, we try to see that even at 600, 700 degrees or even 800 degrees, it's always a single phase. Okay, even long hours of heat treatment uh, will show that it is still a single phase. And then, we started looking at uh, whether this particular alloys, uh, what happens if I add other alloy elements? For example, if you uh, add copper to such an alloy, you start seeing that copper segregates because copper does not dissolve into many of these elements. So it segregates and gives you two phases. And one can actually see these two phases very easily, uh, do an elemental mapping to know where is copper. And you find that copper is in the, what is called interdentic region when compared to the rest of the elements which are all which are all there inside the dendrite. So inside the grain, all these four elements are there, whereas the copper is rejected out of the grain and it goes to the grain boundary region. And that's something that can be proven. 
and one can do the thermodynamic calculations to say how much percentage of uh, uh, these two phases can be predicted and what is the composition of the each phase. And you can actually do experiment and find out what is the observed phase fraction, 44%. The predicted phase fraction is 40. So you can say, yes, you are reasonably close in terms of phase fraction and in terms of composition of the phases. So one can do this with various systems. This is another system where I have taken the same four component alloy, added aluminum now, instead of adding copper. The moment I add aluminum, you get a BCC structure or a B2 structure, which is an ordered BCC kind of a structure. Again, uh, we say that there is a low temperature sigma phase here, uh, which is shown, whereas your actual XRD patterns do not show anything like that. And, and uh, uh, if you actually do heat treatments, there is a possibility of getting a small sigma phase. And that tells you that, yes, it's important to uh, find out whether uh, any second phase can precipitate out of the, the single phases or not by doing various thermal exposure to various temperatures to find out whether the alloy is stable or not. All this can be done, but there are a lot of challenges in uh, thermodynamic predictions of these multi-component systems because there are always certain assumptions which can make uh, sure that your actual predictions may not come very close to the observed conditions. So that's where there is a lot of need for doing a thorough thermodynamic analysis to find out these phase diagrams, multi-component phase diagrams. And I will not go into the details of uh, uh, the thermodynamics to, I don't want to bore you. The second aspect is, if I have these many elements sitting inside the unit cell, how do they diffuse? How do they move? Can I find out the diffusivities of these elements? Because diffusivities are useful to know when you want to uh, find out whether some uh, phase or some alloy is the microstructure is stable at high temperatures or not. The stability, thermal stability, is to a large extent related to diffusion. If the diffusivity is very low, the structures are very stable. If the diffusivity is high, then you can say that uh, there is a tendency for structural changes to happen. So we made the two alloys, of course, large number of alloys we have studied, but I'm just showing you two alloys here. One is a five-component alloy, another is a four-component alloy, and you try to see that whether they are single phase, you see X-ray diffraction, they happily show you a single phase. You do what is called elemental mapping in a, a, a CM, uh, EDS mapping, again, you see everything is very uniform. And then you also do atom probe to find out at the atomic level whether they are uniform or not. Again, you see they are all very uniform. And then you measure the diffusivity stuff. So one can do diffusion experiments. We have collaborated with our friends in Munster. And we are able to do what are called tracer diffusion studies, which give you certain diffusivity numbers. And these numbers, if you compare with the conventional alloys, you see that the diffusivities are not uh, very much sluggish in nature, but the diffusivities are a little lower than what is expected in a conventional alloys. That could be one of the reasons why the, uh, these alloys are thermally stable even at high temperatures. And then uh, we also wanted to see whether there is a grain boundary diffusivity, whether it is different from the bulk diffusion. We did some studies to even find out whether there is any grain boundary segregation in these materials. That also uh, gave us an idea that there is absolutely no segregation even at the grain boundary in these materials. And some diffusion analysis has been done, which appears to be similar to what we get from bulk diffusion studies. We did this on a number of alloys. These are certain compounds where we have done diffusion studies and, and a lot of interesting data that we have obtained. So I will not go into the details of this and tell you that it is possible to do that. And then, then we started uh, thinking of, can we prepare uh, alloys which are high entropy alloys, which can be a replacement for some of the well-known high temperature alloys? There are alloys called nickel-based superalloys, which are used in aircraft engines, okay, which are very expensive, okay, because you have nickel there, which is about 40, I mean 50 percent of nickel or so, and then you have a large amount of cobalt. All these elements are very expensive. 
we started seeing, can we make an equiatomic alloys or slightly near to equiatomic cases and reduce the cost of it and then see if such an alloy can have similar properties as a, a nickel-based super alloy. And we tried to do some thermodynamic calculation, find out the phase diagrams, and finally uh, find out how much of the, what is called uh, the two phases. In this particular alloy, you are supposed to have a matrix and fine particles of what is called gamma prime. This we call it as gamma gamma prime. And we try to heat it to various temperatures for various timings and to know how much growth can take place. These particles, do they grow to what level they can grow? And, and when we do this, we talk in terms of what is called growth kinetics. Okay, And when we look at these growth kinetics, of these materials and try to also see uh, whether these growth kinetics can be associated to interfacial energies between the uh, gamma prime and gamma. To know the interfacial energies, you need to know the interfacial composition. Again, we went to atom probe and tried to find out what is the composition of gamma, what is the composition of gamma, uh, gamma and gamma prime, and from that, uh, get an idea of what are the interfacial energies. And from that interfacial energy, we try to calculate what is the coarsening rate. How do they coarsen? That means how do they become bigger, these particles? Okay, what is the rate at which they grow, particle size? And when we see that, the alloys that we have made, the, the, the three red, blue, and green color, uh, the solid lines, the uh, solid uh, symbols, show that they have the lowest uh, coarsening rate when compared to any of the known commercial alloys. Okay? So this tells you that these alloys can have wonderful uh, lower coarsening rate because of the, the multi-component nature, which reduces the diffusivity to some extent. And possibly that is one of the reasons why you have exceedingly high thermal stability in these alloys. And of course, one can make these alloys in various forms. And we also did what is called uh, uh, processing maps in these uh, alloys. I do not want to go into detail because I was told I have only 30 minutes time. Uh, so we started looking at how do we use these materials for what kind of applications. One such application is coatings. Okay, so there are nickel-based super alloys usually which are coated to improve their efficiency of high temperature capability. And we try to use these high entropy alloys as also a coating material and compare with conventional coating materials. And we find that the alloy that we have coated has about 4.4 gigapascal strength, whereas uh, the conventional alloy has only 2.4 gigapascal strength which tells you that uh, you have much higher strength and wear resistance of these materials so that they can be a wonderful replacements to existing conventional alloy. Again, a lot of collaboration with friends from the yeah, Australian University called Swinburne University. Okay, and we do a lot of studies to understand how this coating process takes place and uh, what kind of microstructures can be developed during coating process. We also uh, did what is called oxidation uh, uh, behavior of this and try to find out whether, because at high temperature, one of the problem is the alloys get oxidized. We want to compare with the conventional alloys that are known, uh, which are called uh, super alloys, and see whether our alloys are better than the super alloys. And we find that they are significantly better than uh, the conventional super alloys in terms of the kinetics of oxidation. And we see that the oxidation resistance is exceedingly high. This has already been patented, and Boeing and Pratt and Whitney are very keen on developing these materials as a new generation. Uh, what is called turbine materials for aircraft engines. So a lot of interesting stuff is happening. And uh, a lot of data, I don't want to bore you with that data. And, and one more very recent work is to create, can we have similar super alloy kind of st strength uh, in even a, a soft material such as aluminum? So we call them as aluminum-based super alloys. And can aluminum alloys, usually aluminum alloys are known to uh, have uh, a reasonable strength at room temperature, but when you heat it, you lose all the strength. By the time you reach around 300 degrees centigrade, most of the aluminum alloys lose all the strength. 
Now what we did was we made these alloys, uh, the so-called uh, multi-component alloy uh, of uh, containing aluminum and developed exceedingly fine nanoparticles of gamma prime kind of structure in a gamma matrix. And what we achieved with, with that is he at the 0.75 of the melting point, okay, which means we are close to the melting point of the alloy. When you look at the uh, strength of the alloy, so the alloy has about 1000 megapascal strength. In comparison, the conventional aluminum alloy called 7075 has only 70 megapascal. You can see this thing. More than 10 times, 15 times. Okay, that's the beauty of these materials. So you can generate by this kind of a concept, very strong materials useful for the uh, high temperature applications or even room temperature applications. So that basically means you are able to generate new alloys with better properties so that they can replace the existing alloys and make them a much cheaper uh, in terms of the cost of alloys. So a lot of exciting applications. The last few slides is to tell you that can we, uh, if the entropy of the alloy is very high, in principle, it should become amorphous. Because uh, amorphous material is what? Amorphous material is a random arrangement of atoms. Okay? There is no periodicity there. Okay? So such kind of an alloy can be de developed by uh, this kind of a process uh, of what is called high entropy alloys. So we, this is one such alloy, a five component alloy, where if you choose the elements properly in such a way that the, there is a, a tendency for the alloy not to form a crystalline solid solution, but can form an amorphous solid solution. How do we know? We see that there is a relation between this uh, crystalline nature and amorphous nature uh, to what is called the strain inside the material. If you add elements together, where the atomic sizes of these elements are similar to each other, then there is not much of a strain inside the material. If there is not much of a strain inside the material, the material is crystalline. We studied this by picking up some 250 alloys and did a very exhaustive study. And to find out when do these high entropy alloys remain as crystalline, when do they become amorphous? We found that when the strain inside the material is large, is a tendency to form amorphous. And that's exactly what we have replaced. And we are able to make now amorphous alloys, which are called glasses, a bulk metallic glasses, we call them as. And such alloys can be made uh, by simply by increasing the entropy of the system. That we call them as entropy stabilized amorphous materials. Okay. And one can uh, also create uh, uh, very interestingly an intermetallic compound, a compound. A compound is mostly ordered structure. But if I take a compound and add a number of elements, for example, take TiNi2, which is a compound, and if I make TiNi2, in addition to just titanium, I add some zirconium and hafnium. In the place of nickel, I add, also add copper and make an alloy, which is a multi-component alloy. And this multi-component alloy is completely amorphous now. You see that I'm able to take a, an ordered compound and destabilize the order just by adding elements by increasing the entropy and then be able to get a completely amorphous material. What is the advantage? That amorphous materials have a lot of advantages. They are exceedingly good materials in terms of corrosion resistance, and they have some very good you know, magnetic properties, some of them, and there are so many people who are excited about using amorphous materials for various applications. I think with that, I will stop here. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you very much, Professor Murthy, for taking us through, you know, uh, in a short span, Oh, for about 45 to 50 minutes. <laughs> uh, all these things which you have shared, I hope uh, must have been really an eye-opener for all those students. And because it's a mixed audience, so I expect uh, a different uh, set of questions. So I have collated a sure. uh, few questions which have been shared. I hope uh, you are able to see those questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Great, great. So 
or or do you have okay let's go to the first question can these alloys be used for domestic application when you say domestic i suppose you are talking about consumer applications right at home home applications so when you say home applications for example uh, if i uh, uh, say something like you know a vessels that we use at home or an electron components in our let's say in our mobiles okay so there are quite a number of applications coming up for this for example the watches that we use we have been able to use these materials as a coating on our watches so that it has much better corrosion resistance than the current materials that are being used for watches okay and much better wear resistance we have demonstrated this with titan company already okay so so the titan company has started making use of these materials for wonderful coating materials so definitely when i say domestic a watch everybody wears a watch more or less so so we are able to and i can talk about a number of such applications that but this is just one application when we do a direct imaging of a liquid nanoparticle interfaces okay it's a, a little very difficult thing because the point is if you put a liquid into a, a, a microscope okay how do you hold this liquid okay you need to have a way to hold this liquid and if you can somehow uh, uh, you are able to hold the liquid in a container let's say and the container does not interfere in the interaction of the any beam for example to see you for example as simple as that i am able to see professor manoj sitting here how am i able to see him i am able to see a light is falling on his face and getting reflected and coming to my eye and then i am able to see him if this room is completely dark i cannot see him right so seeing something is uh, aided by certain radiation falling on an object and getting reflected from there okay so optical microscopes we have where you can have an optical beam falling on a sample getting reflected through an eye piece we can see uh, or there are what are called electron microscopes where you can have an electron beam falling on a sample either getting reflected or getting transmitted to the sample and you see a, a kind of a, a projected image of a sample all this can be done but in the process when this beam is falling on on a liquid and if you have a solid holding that liquid the solid will interfere with the interaction of the beam electron beam or an optical beam with this so there is an interference that comes into picture which makes it a little difficult but if I, there is a way that i can uh, levitate a liquid droplet inside a microscope and then send a beam through it in principle it should be possible people are not yet come up with that kind of microscopes but one day it should be possible what do we do to find a, a better way i try to freeze this liquid and you have of a glass glass is called configurationally frozen liquid okay that means you try to somehow cool the glass very rapidly in such a way that the atoms wherever they are they are frozen there in itself like in in school days we say freeze okay you stand wherever you are in the same pose right so in this kind of a uh, thing if it can be done to a liquid it can be frozen into uh, something called glass what is glass glass is nothing but a solid with exactly the same atomic configuration that is there in the liquid now i can take this solid which is called glass and put it into a microscope and see what is the structure okay so and if there are nano particles inside the liquid in principle i will be able to see that nano particle and the solid interface which is otherwise actually a liquid because i have frozen it configurationally it has become a solid so this is possible and i have been doing it for quite some time when i want to understand the, uh, the structure of a liquid many people say a liquid has a short range order whereas it does not have a long range order how do you know i cannot take a liquid put a uh, put it inside a microscope and see it but i can freeze that liquid into a configurationally frozen solid called glass and now i see it and i get a proof 
completely that yes, it has a long range uh, periodicity missing, but inside the uh, small, small cluster areas, you can actually see an order. And that's what can be done. The third question is how can the technique uh, be useful for studying the disruption of metavalent bonding at the dislocation core? Wow, that's an interesting thing. Yes, in principle, if you have dislocations or uh, grain boundaries or dislocations at the grain boundaries, if you can prepare the sample in such a way that the grain boundaries are uh, parallel to the Uh, Professor Moti, can you hear me? Well, am I audible to the audience, the attendees? You can just write yes in the chat section. Okay, I think uh, there is some internet issue. Maybe Professor Moti will join back. So I request you to kindly be there. And the questions which have been left out, we'll take it up in another minute or so. And in the meantime, I would like to invite all of you for tomorrow's session, which is scheduled at 6.30 p.m. And tomorrow we, okay, he has joined. Yeah, you have to unmute yourself, sir. Okay, so the line seemed to have got disrupted. Yeah, no My problem. Side, I'll, 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 yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it was uh, okay from our side. I'll just share the screen again. Uh -huh. yeah. Anyway, sure, sure. So let me not go into details, but it is possible to know the structure of atoms at the grain boundaries without any difficulty. Okay, uh, computer science, I read machine learning. Okay, uh, okay, so we will change this to magnetic properties. Okay. Can I get an experimental data from your facility to validate? It should be possible, no problem. Uh, only, only thing is, uh, uh, for machine learning, you need a large amount of data. So the best thing is to collect it from the literature. There are so much of literature. In fact, recently, there is a nature paper where uh, somebody using the machine learning came up with a new thermoelectric material, which has not been predicted by anybody. It has been predicted by the machine, okay? Uh, by the computer. Uh, and they say that particular thermoelectric material is the best thermoelectric material ever made by anybody. So, so AI and machine learning is really coming in a big way. Hmm? Definitely. And this is reducing the uh, laborious experimental needs by so many people. For example, Tata Steel tells me that earlier when they want to make a new steel with a new composition with a better property, they used to take three to four years. They say thanks to the uh, uh, machine learning now, uh, they are able to make a new alloy within a few months. So it will tell you what are all the possible. We call this as integrated computational materials engineering. So, so we come up with newer materials very quickly thanks to the uh, availability of a large amount of data. So microscopic observations uncover the oxidation penetration attacks for the alloys, primarily along the grain boundaries for crystalline materials. Uh, okay. Yeah, so very simple. So uh, in any material, you at least seem to be knowing that there is a grain and a grain boundary. Where the junction between any two grains is called grain boundary. And if you look at what is a grain, a grain is a single crystal. That means it has a periodic arrangement of atoms inside. So when you look at grain one and grain two, which are adjacent to each other with a boundary between the two. Now, if you look at the atoms which are sitting at the boundary, they neither belong to grain one nor belong to grain two. There is something like a no man's land there, okay? And in this no man's land, the atoms are uh, not 
clearly periodically arranged the way they are in grain 1 or grain 2. There is a kind of a confusion of what kind of an atomic arrangement that particular atom should take. So there is a little bit of disorder created there. And this disorder increases the energy of the system at the grain boundary. So grain boundaries are high energy regions when compared to the grain. So as a result, uh, if you uh, expose a, a material, polycrystalline material to a corrosive environment or an oxidizing environment, you will see that the grain boundary will be the first one to be attacked. Why? Because any high energy uh, state wants to come to a low energy state much faster. So that is the reason why okay, you will always see grain boundaries getting attacked. Okay. I think that yeah. answers. Fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Professor Murthy, for taking Thank out you. your time. Thank you very much. And I hope that we'll be able to connect with you sometime later, maybe face to face. Sure. 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 Hopefully. Thank you very much. Hopefully. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye to all of you, Thank friends. You. Okay.